Okay, how's that? Do you see my slides? Looks great. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much uh, to Dr. Joe, uh, Margaret Joe, for uh, inviting me and the course organizers, um, Danny uh, Smith, uh, for all your help in making this happen. Um, uh, really a pleasure to come talk to you all. And, you know, hopefully this can be a very, you know, informal talk. Um, I think we've lost the ability of engaging without PowerPoints. So we did make PowerPoints pre presentations, but, um, but really this should be a conversation. And, uh, we're really, you know, happy to be here and to provide um, any guidance about um, hepatology careers. Um, so, um, as um, Margaret mentioned, I'm already I'm, I'm the director of hepatology here at Kaiser Permanente San Francisco Medical Center, and I'm associate program director for our GI fellowship program for Kaiser Permanente Northern California. Um, you know, I think it's always been helpful for me, you know, both as a trainee and even now as young faculty to just kind of hear about you know how different people navigated their own career journeys um, and you know it kind of gives me a lot of perspective and I'm, I'm hoping to provide you a little bit of perspective by sharing my own um, career pathway um, as part of that you know i'd like to share with you kind of what it looks like to be a hepatologist in a private practice setting um, and to just provide you some helpful hopefully you know tips or guidance um, to help you as you start to you know, embark on your own careers and think about um, jobs at a fellowship um, uh, in the coming years. Uh, so I grew up between uh, the Big Apple and um, Khartoum, uh, Sudan, um, uh, and uh, you know, did my undergraduate training at the University of Maryland um, in College Park before going to uh, Nashville. Uh, to do medical school at Vanderbilt University, um, which was great. Um, and then, uh, thanks to my wife, she uh, plugged in me this idea of coming out west uh, to San Francisco. Um, she just loved the city and uh, came out here and luckily was fortunate to match at UCSF uh, and stay there to do my internal medicine and then GI and transplant hepatology training. And I did the um, pilot program. So I did my transplant hepatology training as my third year of GI fellowship for anybody who's interested in that. I, I was their uh, first uh, fellow actually to do that as part of a pilot program. Um, now it's a well-established pathway. Um, after fellowship, uh, one of the faculty who were at UCSF had moved up to Seattle uh, to help start a liver transplant program in um, Seattle at Swedish Medical Center. Um, and so he actually recruited me up there um, to help them grow the program and uh, helped to lead their liver cancer program as well, which was a fantastic experience. Um, and then after about three and a half years, um, I learned about a position here with the Permanente Medical Group um, based in the San Francisco Medical Center um, to be uh, lead for their hepatology program and also to help with uh, a new um, GI fellowship that had just started at the time. So, um, so I was very excited to come back to the Bay Area and I've been here now in my current role about three and a half years. Um, and, you know, I would say throughout, you know, my journey in medicine, I've always been drawn to mentors who, you know, really, you know, wear many hats as they say. Um, and uh, I think that really, you know, excited me about hepatology because it just allows you to have so many opportunities to do things um, even beyond patient care. Um, uh, and, you know, that kind of flexibility uh, was something that really appealed to me. And um, I, you know, I thought this is a great, you know, career choice because you get to do so many things that help keep it exciting day to day and dynamic and, you know, help me wanting to continue learning and evolving, you know, year after year. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think um, uh, it's really proven to be um, the case for me. Um, in terms of, you know, private practice hepatology, like what does that look like? You know, mo most of you are training at academic medical centers, right? And are getting exposure um, to hepatology at, you know, university uh, medical centers. And I think what I want you to come away from this session knowing is that um, there are, you know, a lot of opportunities um, within general and transplant hepat hepatology outside of universities. Um, and oftentimes these positions in private practice groups um, can give you a lot of opportunity to do, you know, scholarly and administrative um, pursuits, um, sometimes even more than at academic medical centers. And I'm sure uh, Dr. Joe uh, will speak to, you know, the, the 
the challenges that can you know be posed by being an academic medical center and getting these kind of opportunities and so and how to navigate that. Uh, but uh, you would be amazed at how you know how many opportunities there are within private practice to do those things and how highly encouraged they are. Um, in large part because it's really almost kind of voluntary um, because you know these kind of things are not. Uh, being considered in terms of your promotion or career advancement. And so um, really leadership at a lot of these medical centers um, really value those individuals who are interested in scholarly pursuits um, and, and, and help you to, um, you know, to get those, uh, those things accomplished during your time. Um, at the same time, it's totally optional. Like, so these places usually are very clinically oriented, right? And so if you're somebody who is just, you know, really just interested in doing patient care, great. Like these opportunities and these roles usually in the private practice setting are you know, well aligned with that um, option of just focusing on patient care. Um, in terms of, you know, what do I do um, day to day? And, you know, my role is very, very largely um, clinical. Um, uh, and so what, you know, private practice hepatologists do, um, we evaluate patients with acute and chronic liver diseases, both in the inpatient and outpatient setting. Um, we are involved in pre-transplant evaluation, as well as perioperative management of patients um, who have decompensated cirrhosis or liver cancer who are undergoing liver transplantation. Um, we often take a lead in post-transplant care at, at many medical centers. Um, uh, the hepatologists are the ones that are primarily managing immunosuppression and you know, post-transplant complications. Um, and we certainly take the lead in uh, the multidisciplinary care of patients with liver cancer. So especially you know, within the context of things like liver tumor boards and you know, coming up with um, uh, comprehensive care plans for patients with liver cancer. Um, and then depending on the particular, um, you know, medical group, um, you may find that, um, you know, some have very little um, general GI responsibilities, um, like doing endoscopy or screening colonoscopies um, and, you know, consulting on general GI patients, but some share equally in that role. And so, um, you, you know, that's something to consider when you're looking at jobs in private practice hepatology. Um, some hepatologists never want to touch a scope, um, don't want to see another sessile serrated polyp in their life, and that's fine. Um, and so, and, and others find, you know, joy in doing endoscopy. And so there's quite a bit of flexibility um, in that respect. Um, as I, you know, alluded to in my own journey, you know, the opportunities to do things outside of patient care, you know, has always been appealing to me. Um, and there's really so many ways, so many ways to get involved um, at the local, national, even international level um, on, you know, different um, activities or endeavors that help shape um, liver disease management. And, you know, you need only just reach out to your mentors or talk to, you know, other folks at our, our society meetings and, you, you will be amazed um, you know, how many opportunities there are. Uh, there's just so much work that needs to be done and it's so welcomed and encouraged. And so um, you should know that you know, even in a private practice setting, um, these opportunities are really abundant. And so you know, when you're you know, thinking about um, your own job prospects, um, I think the things to keep in mind is, are that if you, you know, go into hepatology, you're really going to be acquiring a pretty unique skill set and you know, learning how to manage a very sick population of patients. And um, you know, I want you all to realize um, uh, that you, know, you would be bringing or adding value to any organization um, with this skill set and that you would be an asset to any, any employer. And so, you know, walking into job interviews with that mindset is really important. Um, you know, I want you to, you know, think about more than just, you know, the specific role you're taking, but also kind of the culture of the place that you're thinking about joining. Um, you know, talk, do, do some homework to learn about what your you know, future colleagues might be like, uh, not just within the department, but also, you know, across disciplines. So, you know, what are the pathologists like? What are the radiologists like? What are the, um, you know, surgeons like? Uh, you know, because truly taking care of liver disease patients, as I'm sure Callie and Courtney will attest, um, it takes a village, it really does. Um, you cannot do it on your own. And so, 
um, you know, really surrounding yourself with support um, uh, throughout the institution is very important. So, so talk to people and get to know, you know, what the culture is like. Um, talk to your mentors, talk to your friends about job opportunities that you're you know, thinking about, share with them, you know, what, what is it that excites you about the role, what are concerns you have, and you know, I think you'll be amazed at how, how you know, those things are very universal, like everybody can relate and, and hopefully can help provide you with you know, meaningful perspective and at the very least be a sounding board for you just to kind of hear you talk through um, opportunities that come, uh, come to your attention. Um, and you know, lastly, trust your instinct. You know, because a lot of times your gut, no pun intended, um, is uh, you know really it, it really um, will will not fail you um, in in telling you what's right, uh, what's a good fit for you, and what isn't. But um, but keep an open mind. You know, I I went up to Seattle, you know, to interview for that role. Really, I thought as a courtesy to my mentor. You know, like I just didn't want. I wanted to be polite and. Uh, and not turn down the offer of coming to explore. And it turned out to be an amazing job. And I ended up, you know, going for it um, despite many options. And so um, it was very uh, formative experience for me. And uh, I think if I didn't keep an open mind and actually just explore, I wouldn't have done it. And so I really encourage you to do the same. Um, and so, um, you know, key takeaways um, are that, you know, hepatologists really have a unique um, skill set um, that uh, hepatology positions in private practice really come in all shapes and sizes. So kind of uh, along the same lines of my, you know, keep an open mind and explore. Don't automatically assume that if it's not a university um, setting that you're not going to get what you want out of your career, especially if it's um, doing, you know, more academic or scholarly pursuits, because um, you have plenty of opportunity to do those things and it's highly welcomed in most settings. Um, the demand for hepatologists is very, very high. And so, you know, I want you to keep that in mind uh, as you're exploring options that a lot of these employers really want you. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's really, you are interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. Um, and, um, you know, I just encourage you to, to pursue positions or opportunities that you feel like will help you grow you know, as an individual and as a professional um, in the field um, and to challenge you. Um, I think those are the ways that, you know, it helps to keep you uh, on your feet and excited to go day to day um, uh, to, to the hospital. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, sorry if I was kind of just rambling random thoughts, but um, I'm happy to take uh, questions um, uh, at the end. I think we're going to have a Q&A session. And so um, I'll turn it back to Dr. Joe, Margaret, because I think next up will be Dr. Sherman. Is that right? Yes, that is right. Thanks so much, Dr. Mukhtar, for sharing all of that. Um, it sounds like it's been such a positive experience, and I'm excited to ask some questions at the end of this. So um, next, we want to welcome Dr. Courtney Sherman, our second speaker. She is an assistant clinical professor of medicine at UCSF uh, with interests in general and transplant hepatology. She got her MD from New York Medical College and completed her internal medicine, GI, and transplant hepatology fellowships at UCSF, um, much like Dr. Mukhtar. Uh, she is the Transplant Hepatology Fellowship Program Director and the Director of Quality Assurance and Quality Improvement for the Division of Hepatology. And in addition, she is the lead for the Alcohol Associated Liver Disease Program at UCSF. Um, her research interests are in the management of alcohol associated liver disease. Um, so thanks so much for being here um, and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Um, let me just get my slides up here. Sorry, I accidentally closed them. So give me two seconds. This is always what I like to do. Sorry about this. I swear no, I was worry. ready and then now I'm not. <laughs> No, um, give me one second. No worries at all. We all have our issues with Zoom. <laughs> I would think that that after this long, I would have totally figured it out, right? All right. 
Sorry for the delay, everybody. I'm very excited to be with you. Thank you, Nazar, for such a great kind of, um, kind of history of your journey. And I think I'm going to echo a lot of the points that you made as well. Um, once I get my act together and get these slides going. All right. Let's see. Are you seeing the back or the front? The back. It's, yeah, it's in presenter mode. Okay, let me stop again. <laughs> it's this is a joy. No, it's okay. Okay. Now we should be on track. Yes. Perfect. Excellent. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, thanks so much. Sorry for the delay, everybody. Um, thank you so much for having me, and thanks for the warm introduction, Margaret. Um, like Nazar, I like to wear a lot of hats, as you can tell. Um, and so uh, I'll kind of go into how I kind of manage all of these things and why I do all of these things and um, and also tell you that you don't need to do all of these things in academic medicine. Um, so my goal is to talk about um, kind of what a clinician educator uh, looks like in hepatology in an academic medical center. Um, so, you know, as Margaret mentioned, I am uh, an associate professor of clinical medicine. I am the uh, recent, uh, a recent change in our fellowship program. I'm now the program director. I'm the director of the hepatology education at UCSF. I um, direct the QI uh, division uh, in hepatology, uh, also direct our hepatology outreach clinics, and I lead our alcohol-associated liver disease program. Um, so my path, uh, I started in Los Angeles. I did my undergraduate um, at UC San Diego, went to New York Medical College. I did residency with the wonderful Dr. Mukhtar um, at UCSF. I was a chief uh, resident at the VA in San Francisco. And then I, uh, similar to Nazar, did uh, the accelerated transplant hepatology program. Um, and so that means I did uh, GI for two years and then I did uh, transplant hepatology for my third year. Um, my first job was at California Pacific Medical Center, which is a fantastic uh, institution where I was a general and transplant hepatologist. I was there for a couple years um, until an opportunity arose back at UCSF, uh, and I ended up choosing to take that opportunity uh, to focus more on uh, academic pursuits. Um, though, as Nazar mentioned, you know, regardless of the institution, there are academic and scholarly pursuits um, that you can find at any institution. So I kind of think about my day and my role as kind of how am I filling my pie pieces? And so I thought, I hope that this kind of helps you understand a little bit more about kind of what I, you know, the percentages of time that I spend doing different jobs. So as you can see, the majority of my job is clinical care. Um, and, you know, I am a, a clinician first and foremost, but as a clinician educator, I spend um, most of my time doing clinical work, but a lot um, on uh, trainee and health professional um, education. So um, just over 50% of my time is spent on clinical care, and then 20% of my time is spent uh, being the Transplant Hepatology Fellowship Program Director, and between 5 to 10% of my role is um, in my directorship. So whether that's outreach, QI, hepatology education, or alcohol-associated liver disease. Um, so that's kind of how I fill my pie uh, at work. Um, I have clinical and educational responsibilities. So this is kind of the nitty gritty of what my kind of days look like and what my weeks look like. So I'm in transplant or general hepatology clinic um, three half days per week. I do an outreach clinic um, in Fresno or Modesto one day per month. I do endoscopy one day per month. Um, I am not one of those people who love sessile serrated adenomas. So I actually just do endoscopies. I've stopped doing colonoscopies. My colleagues, uh, many of my colleagues do colonoscopies and upper endoscopies. So I am just different in that way. Um, I do six to eight weeks of inpatient liver transplant service and hepatology consult attending. I go to liver transplant selection every week, uh, which is a couple hours. I go to liver uh, cancer tumor board um, at least once a week, sometimes twice a week. And so those are kind of, that's the bulk of my clinical responsibilities. 
On the educational side, I precept fellows clinic, endoscopies, liver biopsies. Um, I'm responsible for the transplant hepatology fellowship curriculum and making sure that the fellowship runs uh, with my fantastic administrator. Um, I mentor fellow QI projects, and um, as part of my hepatology education directorship, I uh, do lectures for the internal medicine residency, nephrology, ICU services, and kind of other uh, talks um, at UCSF uh, that are hepatology education focused. So in thinking about the clinician educator pathway, um, I found some great articles that I, I wanted to just kind of share uh, with you all so that you can kind of reference them if you think that they're interesting. But there was one quote that I that I saw that was really kind of kind of spot on. So the variability in what a career as a clinician educator may look like can be both an obstacle and an opportunity. And so I, I think that that really encapsulates um, kind of what it is to be a clinician educator. There are so many different things that you can do, which is, you know, a great opportunity, but also, you know, you can put obstacles in front of yourself by kind of taking too many things on. Um, you know, clinician educators are really the backbone of clinical and educational missions at academic centers. Um, and so uh, we're very important. Um, as I mentioned earlier, time uh, is primarily spent on clinical care with a focus on trainee um, and health professional education. So in one of these articles that I found um, called Cracking the Clinician Educator Code in Gastroenterology, it was published in Clinical Gastro and Hepatology in 2017, they uh, basically gave five recommendations on kind of what to do to be, you know, cracking the clinician educator code in GI. And so I kind of took those five recommendations and added my own spin on them. So I hope that you find them to be helpful. So the first one is, you know, make sure that you're maintaining a current CV and a teaching portfolio. Um, you know, this is to document your accomplishments and you should be proud of all of the things that you're doing, however big or small, you know, this, you know, talk that you're giving or, you know, some curriculum development that you're, that you're doing, document it. Um, you know, a teaching portfolio may be something that you're not, you know, very familiar with and your institution may have that um, or not. Um, if not, there are some great articles out there on how to put that together, but it presents teaching activities, not just as like a list, but it really kind of demonstrates demonstrates evident, the evidence of kind of influence that your work has had on other people and other groups. Make sure that you're getting advice um, and feedback on your CV and your teaching portfolio from your mentors. It's really important to keep these up to date, especially when you are in that job and you are looking for your promotion. Um, so I recommend updating these at least quarterly or as the events occur. So, you know, when you get an article published, get, you know, pop it into your CV when you are teaching a course um, for med students or residents or, or whatever you're teaching, pop that into your teaching portfolio and your CV. If you're, abs if you're presenting abstracts, um, make sure that you're getting those in uh, in a timely fashion. And keep track of all your committee involvements, leadership roles, and the memberships to the organizations um, that you hold. Um, it's also really important and something that I didn't realize when I uh, started back at UCSF, that you really need to know what your institutional requirements are for promotion and advancement. And I will show you this slide just to tell you that it is um, not always straightforward. I feel like this emoji when I think about advancement. So, you know, to go from an assistant to an associate to a professor, there are all these steps and all of these things that may or may not make sense. And so it's just really important to, once you finally pick that job that you're going to take, to understand what you know, what you need to achieve, you know, going from step one to two to three to then be an associate. Um, and so I pulled up the kind of uh, requirements for UCSF. So advancement within the health um, educator pathway um, is based on a sustained record of excellence in teaching and clinical competence, along with evidence of accomplishment and creative activities. So that could be educational programs, community health programs, QI, um, DEI, administration leadership. So it really has a broad breadth of what you can do um, to support your advancement and you know really support your career development. So I would just recommend that as soon as you find this job that you're excited about, um, get advice from your mentors and department or division leadership early to make sure that you are on track to move forward um, in your pathway for advancement. Um, so that's number one. Number two in cracking the code is 
you know, mentors and mentees. So really work on, if you haven't already, identifying a primary mentor with an interest in and experience with mentoring and somebody who's committed to fostering your growth. Um, and really, once you identify this mentor, take ownership of the success of this relationship. Um, you know, be the one who organizes the meetings and set up regular meetings, develop specific goals and measurable outcomes, communicate your needs with the mentor. So, you know, I would say develop smart goals, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. And I think that you'll be on good track. And one thing to be thinking about as you're moving forward in kind of your mentorship journey, um, that one measure of a successful mentor-mentee relationship is the development of a mentee into a new mentor for future mentees. Oops. I jumped ahead. So number three is to think broadly and creatively about scholarship. So it's not just about a list of papers that have been published. So think about, you know, all of the different things that that you could do. So QI is a great example and an important method of scholarship that, you know, really can be inspired by your everyday opportunities, you know, wanting to reduce variability in HCC screening practices or cirrhosis care or vaccinations. Um, you know, this is something that you handle every day. And so whatever QI work you do, that is scholarship. And so make sure that you are, you know, understanding that that scholarship and try to disseminate that work. It's also important to, to try to reach beyond your own department or even your own um, institution and collaborate across departments um, in educational scholarly activities and really try to create a diverse network across which you, know, you can amplify your work um, and achieve a greater impact as well. And kind of along the same lines, share broadly. Um, you know, your scholarly activities can target many audiences from med students, residents, other fellows to faculty and patients in the community. So really work on disseminating your work and share with a wider audience, um, you know, not if not just GI and hepatology journals, but also think if you're doing a lot of med ed, think about medical education journals as well. And then the, the number five crack in the code um, is ongoing professional development. So explore educational opportunities at your institution and beyond. So at UCSF, we have a center for faculty educators. They run a series of webinars and courses um, to teach you how to be a better teacher. And as I was kind of prepping for this um, webinar, I looked at the AGA and they have the Academy of Educators where fellows um, and other members can apply and get um, training on being an, a better educator. So I thought that was another um, great thing for people to, to look into. Get involved in your regional and national organizations. So AASLD has special interest groups. American Society of Transplantation has communities of practice. Um, and there are you know, many organizations to get involved with. So I think that's really important. Um, I think that is the same slide, sorry. Um, okay, and then uh, as you're transitioning from being a fellow to an academic faculty, I thought this was a really nice flow diagram that I saw in a paper that was published in Gastro in 2013. Um, so the first step is making the choice to do academic medicine. So think about kind of the intrinsic and extrinsic motivations for your career choice. So intrinsic being job satisfaction, career satisfaction, life satisfaction, and extrinsic things being like promotion, your financial success, grants, publications, leadership positions, reputation, you know, whatever is important for you. But think about all of those things. And you know, try to identify an area of focus, um, kind of a niche for your interests and prioritize things that are important to you, like location, what a job really looks like and your compensation. Those are things that you may not have had to think about, especially compensation um, when you're a resident or a fellow. So this is the, kind of the first time you're gonna be thinking about that. And it's kind of exciting, but it's also kind of scary. Um, when you're looking for opportunities, you know, look broadly, you know, create a list of potential institutions that fulfill the criteria that sound exciting to you. Um, reach out to divisions of interest and ask your mentors to do that for you. So um, I think it's it's always better, uh, at least in my opinion, and I'm, I'm interested to hear from, from the rest of the, the panel, but I think it's great to have your mentors reach out to their colleagues at the in, in institutions that you're interested in, because that kind of warm discussion about you um, can really give the institutions an idea of kind of what a, what a fantastic gastroenterologist or hepatologist you are. Um, so ask your mentors to help with that. Um, 
you know, plan your visits to the institutions for interviews, job talks, things like that. And then negotiating can be really scary. Um, so get advice on that. Um, get advice from, you know, your mentors and other people who are particularly well suited in um, kind of negotiating financial things. So I know for myself, I have one person that I go to um, for all of these kind of questions, because I just, I just don't know. Um, so think about that. And then um, we've already kind of talked about creating a mentorship team um, and kind of your start of your career. Um, so a few more things about job expiration, and then I'm, I'm almost done. Um, this is the first time you don't have a match for many of you. And so you have choices, and that is exciting and scary. And I was just talking with um, a couple of our transplant hepatology fellows and who are now looking for jobs. And I think it's a little bit intimidating to think that you have value and that you are going to add value to another institution. It's like, oh, please just like just hire me, please. Um, and that is not how you should be feeling. You should be feeling, hey, I have a lot of value to add and I am really fantastic and I'm well-trained. And uh, you know, as Nazar mentioned, make sure that you're advocating for yourself and that you recognize your value because um, it's really important. Um, you are very marketable coming out of fellowship. Um, and so just remember that. Um, and no job is perfect. You can tailor to your interests. And as you've seen from both Nazar and myself, our first job is not our last job. So if your first job isn't perfect, that's okay. But just, you know, think about what you want and, you know, find a position that suits you best. Keep an open mind, cast a broad net and see what's out there. So go to institutions um, that you may not have thought of. Um, as, as Nazar did and, you know, consider the opportunities that are out there. And also, you know, when you're thinking about mentors and role models, identify colleagues who have similar interests and roles, see how they got there and get advice from them. Um, so that's all I have. That also was kind of a stream of consciousness. So I hope that that was helpful. Um, and I'm happy to take questions at the end. Thank you so much, Dr. Sherman. Um, those are so many very helpful and concrete tips for um, cracking the code. So uh, thank you. <laughs> um, last but not least, I'd like to introduce Dr. Callie Joe. Um, Dr. Joe is a transplant hepatologist and assistant professor in the division of gastrointestinal and liver diseases at the Keck School at the University of Southern California. She received her medical degree um, from Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern. She was a Fulbright Scholar and completed a T32 GI and Transplant Hepatology Fellowship at UCSF as well, where she also received a master's in clinical research. She is currently supported by a K23 through the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. And her current research program focuses on disparities in liver cancer and utilizing novel geospatial approaches to improving cancer equity and outcomes for multi-ethnic populations. Um, so thanks so much for being here today. Thanks, Margaret. Sorry, that was a mouthful. Um, so, <laughs> Very accomplished. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm really excited to um, be here to talk to you guys about a uh, slight sh uh, shift in gears in academic career in research. Um, and I'm going to thank um, Niam and the rest of the NSC, uh, SCG for inviting me. Um, so, um, you know, it's so funny, Courtney, that was a fantastic presentation. I love how you cited all these papers and it was so data-driven. Um, I will say I do not cite any papers in mine. I feel like I should be embarrassed to not do so, but- um, It's a it's, team uh, effort, Kelly, it's a team effort. <laughs> Um, so I, like Margaret said, I'm an assistant professor of clinical medicine at the University of Southern California. I do not, uh, I currently am a director of nothing, but hopefully in the future I can add um, a couple lines to this um, as we go, as uh, progress. So essentially, um, I grew up in Southern California. I um, did my undergrad and my medical school at Northwestern. So I was in the seven year program that no longer exists, um, but it was great. I did three years of undergrad, didn't have to take the MCATs, not complaining. Um, and then I went on to um, my internal medicine residency at UCLA. And this is where things sort of shifted. I, um, prior to that, I was very, very, very clinical. I had essentially done zero research um, and really thought of myself as a clinician. I love medical school. I loved the last two years of medical school specifically. And um, I thought I was you know, really gonna be focusing on uh, caring for patients. And then I did this tiny, tiny research study with um, Sammy Saab on hepatitis C and the new DAs and it was so exciting. And you know, I, I don't know, something, something changed. And I was like, you know, this, is something so different from clinical care, something um, that might really impact you know, 
populations at large. And I was like, you know, if I don't pursue this a little bit more and really explore it, I might come to regret it. So given that I um, did college in three years, I said, you know what, I can take a year off. Um, and I did something that's a little bit unique. I took a year off between residency and fellowship, and it was very scary. Um, but, it, you know, probably the big best decision of my, of my life. Um, and I spent a year in China and really dedicated myself to research. I did a number of different types of research. I just, you know, it did whatever came along and, and learned. And, you know, I was like, you know, I really do enjoy this. I still wasn't sure at the end of that year. I still wasn't sure that I wanted to do research, but I wanted to give myself the opportunity um, to do it in the future. So that's how I ended up at UCSF in the T32, um, getting the master's, um, uh, doing my advanced fellowship, and then finally coming full circle back to Southern California uh, in my first job, and which I've been in for the last three years. So the role of a clinician scientist is very different. So you're really spending 75 to 80% of time on research. What does that actually mean? That means you're sitting at a desk in front of a computer for 75 to 80% of your time. Um, so it's, yeah, it's quite a shift, especially coming out of fellowship. You know, you're busy, busy, busy doing clinical work and suddenly you're like, oh my gosh, I have all this free time. Now I got to figure out how to do things on my own. Um, so it's limited time for clinical work. So as a hepatologist, because we wear so many hats in the clinical setting, this means that you're probably going to give something up. So whether that's post-transplant care, potentially non-transplant care, if you only want to see transplant patients, potentially endoscopy. So I, I ended up giving up post-transplant care. Um, and I, I, so my schedule is currently one to two half days of clinic a week, which I split between non-transplant and my pre-transplant clinic. I do about two to three weeks of inpatient a year. Um, so pretty limited. And then I currently do a half day of endoscopy, which honestly is not enough to be taking out serrated uh, polyps, let me tell you, but you know, it is what it is. Um, and um, so it's, it's, it's limited, but I will say it is enough to really still feel like you're engaged in clinical care, still feel like you're seeing patients and taking care of patients. Um, it is enough, um, but it's not a lot. And in this role, the expectation is that you're going to have independent grant funding and you're gonna be spending a significant amount of your time trying to acquire that funding. So if you do not like writing grants, this is just not gonna be it for you because that is unfortunately um, what you have to have to do. Um, and then also building, really building a research program of your own. What that means is finding collaborators, uh, training mentees in research, um, running a whole uh, cohort of research coordinators that help you out, potentially postdocs. So really um, it's more than just about you. You actually do develop a team of people um, that you ultimately are responsible for and are working with. So I wanted to give you guys an idea of timelines. I think for a lot of trainees, when you're you know, getting into this, you're like, I have no idea what I need to do by when. Um, and I didn't really know until I really got to think of it. Um, but so it's, as you're in fellowship, as you're you know, finishing out your fellowship, it's really unlikely that you're gonna have a grant, that you're gonna be you know, funded going into your first job. It is, it's not an expectation, but I will say that if you are just one of those people who are um, incredible and are able to do this, it's definitely a plus. It will give you a leg up when you're looking for your first job. Um, but generally you're not gonna go in without, without that grant, but you're gonna be given time by the institution because you're going into this role to get that first grant. So the, the typical expectation is that you're gonna have some sort of more limited career development grant, either a foundation award from one of our GI societies or potentially an internal grant. So KL2s are generally mechanisms within your institution supported by the NIH, typically two years long, that allows you to further pursue research training and protects your time, usually 75% of your time. So within one to two years, you're looking at hopefully having one of these under your belt so that your institution's not continuing to pay your salary without any sort of support. And then within four years, um, you're typically expected to have um, either an NIHK award or some sort of equivalent award. And generally this is a bigger career development award that's gonna last you between three to five years. Usually people um, try to you know, fill out the entire five years um, of protection. And that again, provides a salary for you to have 75% protected time for at least five years. So um, that's the expectations within four years, you're gonna be um, on one of those. And then, about three to four years into your career development award, you should be writing your first R01. So how did that look like for me? Um, so I made this horrible decision to actually try to have a grant coming out of fellowship. Um, so I applied for society uh, grants during my last year of training um, and it was the most stressful thing in my life. I was looking for jobs on inpatient LTU, writing this grant, studying for boards. It was a horrible idea. Needless to say, I did not get it. And that was not a surprise. Um, and this is to show you, you know, it really wasn't until my 
first year um, of my job that um, I had any grants. And that's completely normal. You're going to apply many, many times. You're not going to get it. And generally, people do not get their uh, grant on the first try. Um, but coming into year one, um, I had some small, so within an institution, I had pilot awards. I was able to provide me at least with some money to start gathering preliminary data to be able to compete for bigger awards. Um, and I got the ASLD Foundation Award in my second year of my job. Um, at that time, I was also um, now starting to apply for the five-year career development awards. And I applied for both, um, one from the American Cancer Society, which is equivalent to the, the NIHK 23 um, you know, it's interesting. I applied for the um, American Cancer Society Award a year before the K, and unfortunately, due to COVID, they actually deferred all. You know, I put it in, everything was submitted, and they were like, "We're not going to review it for an entire year because of COVID." So that was a, a bit devastating. But um, it did go in ultimately after COVID, um, and that was actually the first career development, um, five-year career development award that I did get funded. Um, and then about six months after that, my K-23 also got funded. So pretty exciting as things you know, rolled along, but this is generally the, um, the expectation. So it could be many, many years out of fellowship before you, you have that K and that's totally okay. Um, so how does one get even get started? Um, so I think the key thing is if you want to do this, you really have to set yourself up for success because we were not, you know, coming out of medical school, et cetera. This, this was not the trajectory that you expected. So it's almost like learning an entirely, entirely new language, entirely new field. Um, so how do you set yourself up? So look for programs, institutions, really seek them out that have a T32 because having a T32 means that they're gonna protect your time so that you can learn this, the skills needed during fellowship and have the time to do it and not be, you know, you can't do it when you're in a fully clinical fellowship. It's just not possible. T32 also means that there are mentors. The NIH only gives T32s out there for institutions that have demonstrated a track record of research and mentorship. So, so you know that you're gonna be in a good spot to start. Um, during that T32, I highly recommend you get that master's because again, different, totally different world, completely different language that you have to learn. Statistics, you know, um, was completely new to me. You can do a master's, some places ask for you to do a PhD. Um, I don't necessarily think a PhD is necessary and it's potentially a long path, but depending on what you want to do, basic science, et cetera, it might be necessary to do a PhD. And then in this time, it, it is really important to publish. Um, and um, I think quality is more important than quantity as usual, um, but publishing is really RRVs. Like it tells you, you know, it tells people that you can complete projects and gives you, you know, gives you uh, visibility in the field. It's just, you know, absolutely essential for, for this path. Um, and then during this time is when you choose, and really should be mentors with an S because you're gonna have more than one mentor throughout your career path of research. I had a different mentor in residency than I did in fellowship. Obviously my mentorship from fellowship to my first job did continue as my mentor moved um, as well as I did. But for most of you, it's probably, it might not at all be the same mentor, but different mentors throughout your path. Um, but choose your mentor wisely and choose it up front. So choose them early. I think the whole point is to, to get in early because you need that one, like longitudinal time with that person um, to be able to develop a profile. Um, and choosing them wisely means um, look to see who, look at who they've mentored in the past and actually talk to those people. So I talked to a lot of former mentees of the different options of mentors that I had before I ended up um, choosing my mentor. Um, so definitely ask around um, and look, and just uh, again, look at their track record because if they've mentored mentees successfully in the past, they're more likely to um, be able to do so for you. And in terms of choosing your research path, I feel like it's important to be true to yourself in, in terms of what you want to do and what you like to do. I think sometimes um, in research, it's very, um, uh, it's, it's, it's very easy to, to try to hit on what's hot or like, you know, what it seems like people are interested in and not something that necessarily you're interested in yourself. Um, but it's important to look at something that you're passionate about. Otherwise, you're never going to be able to, you know, have the passion to continue in that in that field. So, but you do have to be flexible. So I have switched my research topics numerous times now throughout um, my very short career already. And, you know, looking at someone like Nora, who's my mentor, she literally touched every area of liver disease throughout her uh, course of um, time. So, you know, it's, you, don't, you don't have to do one thing and you can always switch, just know that. And then lastly, be persistent and apply often. So you do have to have a really thick skin. Um, the average number of rejections before publication is three to four. I could swear my, my hitting uh, batting average is much higher than that. Um, your average age at your first R1 for MDs, because we have that long length of clinical training is actually 45. 
So don't feel bad. We are, you know, you're in your 30s. You got a lot of time before you could write your first R1. Um, and only about 30% of brand new projects are funded. So just don't forget, you know, if you don't get that grant, if you don't get whatever, it's it's you know, it's okay. Try and try again, and eventually you'll get there. Um, and then in terms of ways of building your academic profile, you know, research, it's important to again have that visibility, um, network, and all of that. So the first thing I think when you're a fellow coming into this is it's it's hard because you don't have any you know you don't have time you don't have you don't have the existing you know data anything like that so look within your own institution um, look at what your institution has what cohorts are have already been built what can you just sort of slide into and and take um, something that's existing and ask a new question of it um, look into your institution but also across disciplines um, so there are other fields that might have data actually about the liver but related to something else like i think cardio is a great example of a cohort that was made for cardiovascular disease but you can look at liver related outcomes within it um, if your institution is in one of these nih funded networks so with hepatitis b research network the nash um, clinical research network and the soon to be liver cirrhosis network which there's many 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 institutions and many sites for um, there's a lot of opportunities for ancillary studies so i did my one of my first ancillary studies was through the hepatitis b research network i met all of these amazing people within the field of hepatitis b um, you know came up with a very small study of my own within that larger network um, and it was a really great learning opportunity and in terms of networking obviously our societies are really really important SIGs are a great way for trainees to get involved um, emerging liver scholars to apply for those sort of opportunities um, the American Society of Transplantation the liver intestinal community of practice is fantastic it's a great home um, for transplant hepatologists and trainees um, and then um, apply for so there's external opportunities the AGA is held the academic skills workshop I did when I was a fellow it was fantastic really really helpful um, and you know just know every you can do all these things at your own pace I always felt like I think early on I was like why wasn't I doing more why wasn't I getting involved in more things but honestly take it at your own pace there's it's not a race um, do everything but do it well enjoy it you know take your time um, and then Twitter you know for better or worse I didn't really well, I'm not going to talk much about it, but you guys all know um, how uh, prominent Twitter is, I think, in our field and, and, and growing. So so get involved in that if that's if such a media is your thing. Um, and then considerations for your first job. So research is different. It's not quite like a clinical job. There are a lot of things that you might need that and you have to think about. Um, it's important to negotiate. Like Courtney and Yazara said, you have a lot to offer. And even though it doesn't feel like it, this is the first job is actually your first best opportunity. That very first entry point is a best opportunity to negotiate. I didn't do it and I really regret it now. Um, so, you know, be aggressive, negotiate. Worst thing they can say is no. Um, research into your institution. So are there current factor, faculty that actually have the type of position I want? Um, honestly, coming to USC, that didn't really exist. But I knew Nora was going to be here. So I had, you know, I was, they were going to create it. But it didn't actually exist. So coming in here without Nora would have probably been a horrible idea. Um, so figure out are there people with that position? Is there tenure track and non-tenure track options? Because um, you don't always need to be tenure track in some institutions in order to do research. And, and figuring that out is actually important. Um, are you going to come in as an assistant uh, professor? Are you going to come in as a um, clinical instructor? All of that may um, ultimately be important to you. And then what resources are readily available to researchers at your institution? Um, are there you know is a seed funding for um, new investigators? Are there um, already, you know, a CTSI or, you know, things that might actually help um, uh, elevate your research? And then other departments outside of medicine that you can collaborate with. So I didn't necessarily know this coming into USC, but um, I actually work mostly with departments outside of medicine. So population, public health sciences, spatial sciences. I didn't know any of this coming into it. I wish I did, but um, figure out are there, are there other departments doing work that might be tangential or something that you could tap into when you're there you're at, at that institution. Um, I'm gonna talk about internal funding. And then um, in terms of divisional infrastructure, so not all divisions are equal. Um, no, figure out what they already have. Are there divisional biostatisticians that you use or if, are you on your own essentially? You don't wanna be on your own. Um, are there research coordinators that are already there that you can tap into while you build your program and get the funding to have your own research coordinators? Are there existing biobanks? Are there start startup funds? If you wanna do research, you should be getting a startup fund um, with your initial package when you start your job. Um, but think, think really hard about what you need, what you might need, um, and then ask for it if it's not there. All right, so um, just to conclude, academic training research 
incredibly rewarding. I'm grateful every day uh, for what I get to do and how creative I get to be in my job. Um, and it's great. Your time is often your own. There's so much flexibility, uh, work-life balance. Um, pathway is more narrow and sometimes you do have to sacrifice. Um, so whether it's a geographic sacrifice or maybe this isn't the exact institution or exact, you know, exact job that you want to do, you know, there, there are going to be sacrifices, um, but I think it's worth it. And then learning on the job is given, again, give yourself a break um, when things don't necessarily go your way and take the leap and enjoy it. And, oh, here's my contact information and the Twitter that I didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Thanks so much, Dr. Joe. Love your presentation and kind of the honest exploration of a research career and all the GIFs. Um, <laughs> so thank you three. It's such a great and enriching discussion. Um, I just want to, I know we have like four minutes left. That hour really flew by. Just want to open up the floor for any questions. I don't see any in the chat, so please feel free to unmute yourself at this time if you have any questions you want to pose to our lovely panelists. Thanks, Nazar, Courtney, and Kali. I um, I really enjoy all of the presentation and different viewpoints. 